Hello, everybody. Welcome back into Debate Night. A uh, little different setup today. You may have remembered uh, quite a few weeks ago, maybe three or four now, we did an episode like this. We're doing another one because we got some special guests in town. So you definitely recognize the guy on the end right here, uh, Gary is joining us in person. Um, what an experience, what a pleasure, what a privilege. And uh, we also have Josh here. Josh has never been on this show. Have you ever appeared in any? Yes, you were in a Bogey Bro battle Ace on the Foundation uh, channel. Mm -hmm. People will know you from there. One of our Heiser Club members and also in town for the same reason Gary is. I can't give you too much details on that. All I'm saying is we're filming something pretty special right now. Keep your eyes posted on the Foundation channel because um, yeah, in a little bit, there's going to be some pretty cool things dropping. So that's why these guys are in town, and we thought we'd bring them in for more of this conversational debate night situation that we did last time when we had Brody and Robbie in town. Basically, we've got some fun topics to talk about. We're going to throw them around the table and just see what happens. That's how it's going to go. Before we get into that, I've got a quick word from the sponsor of today's episode, and that is Manscaped. All right, guys, it's the best time of the year. Football is back. We're talking NFL Sundays, college football Saturdays, and that glorious grind of fancy football lineups. Um, it is where your inner GM comes alive, setting the perfect fancy roster, screaming at your TV, and making last-minute waiver moves that either make you the hero or the guy everybody ridicules in the group chat. But here's the thing. Um, don't let personal grooming be the guy that gets left on the bench. Let's be honest. Nobody wants to fumble their grooming routine. That's where Manscaped's Performance Package 5.0 5.0 Ultra comes in acting as your all-in-one grooming playbook from keeping things sharp down below with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra to taking care of those rose, those rogue nose and ear hairs with the Weed Whacker 2.0. This is the lineup that'll keep you looking and feeling like a champ on and off the field. If you want to join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, you can go to manscaped.com, use code debate night to get 20% off plus free shipping. You guys want to get this kit. It is incredible. It's an all-in-one grooming kit and the Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is it is your complete grooming playbook. It handles everything from below the waist maintenance to taking care of those nose and ear hairs. Consider it your winning lineup, helping you feel clean, confident, and ready to dominate your fantasy league. It comes with the Lumber 5.0 Ultra trimmer. It is incredible. This is the franchise player of your grooming roster. It's got precise trimming capabilities, and it is built for performance. It also has that Weed Whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, extremely helpful, as well as some aftercare products and two free gifts. You can get the Shed Travel Bag and the Boxers 2.0 Midnight Bravo, which is who doesn't love free gifts? Always great. So if you want to check these out, you can go to manscaped.com and use code Debate night for 20% off plus free shipping. That's code debate night at manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring this episode. Let's get into it. So, Josh, I'll have you kind of introduce yourself first because you haven't appeared on this show before. These guys have been around quite a bit. So let them know where you're from, what's your disc golf experience, and um, maybe just give them a really opinionated take on the Pro Tour this year. Uh, I'm Josh Alcock. I'm from Harrisburg, PA, now live in Lancaster, PA. Uh, I've played about six years now, I want to say. Um, found disc golf when worlds popped up on my youtube feed randomly um had never heard of it before that wow. and fell in love um i'm about 965 rated now um and pro tour i feel like i've definitely watched a little less this year than previous years um i do like how there are a lot more winners in fpo now uh but Gannon Burr is definitely running away with things. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because it gives someone a goal to get to. Hey, that was FPO last year. So mm. fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, well, we are going to talk a little bit about um, that in specific. So I'll, I'll start with, I think, one of the big stories in disc golf that I did want to talk about. Um, I, I know Tour Life discussed this, Grip Lock discussed everybody discussed it, but I kind of want to throw around this table. So recently we had one of the more interesting like I, scandals, realistically scandals break in disc golf where we basically had a big tournament director um, essentially embezzle money. I don't know if that's the term that we're supposed to be throwing around, but allegedly embezzle money. I know the resources is used allegedly for everything in these situations um, where he had tournament funds, used them for personal expenses and can't pay people back. So what I want to say is we've heard some different opinions from this, like certain people coming out in support of this person other people like very much black and white like this guy needs to go to jail um gary you actually had your own uh, kind of fun theory on this what are, you, what are your thoughts on this situation uh, you know for those of you who, who kind of paid attention to the big sales going on over the past few days dynamic has come out and they're like 
having these really like almost a fire sale on discs to the point where I've got people lighting me up left and right. If you want to get this, go on this right now, go on the site and get it. And I said, it's kind of funny how they're doing this quick cash grab. I wonder if they're trying to make this money to, to pay off <laughs> the funds to all these players just to save face, you know, for what's going on because of how closely he is related to dynamic and everything like that. So yeah, most yeah. likely not the case, but no, definitely no, a fun no. theory. Definitely it, it, the a fun timing theory. of it is just so interesting. But. Yeah. Um, yeah, Josh, like, where do you sit as far as, have you, like, how, how well do you know the situation? Have you read into it? I've read a little, like, an article or two, but yeah. nothing crazy. Yeah, like, what, what is your perception seeing that immediately? Were you very quick to be, like, dang, seems like you got caught into something, like, bad, or was it, is it, like, no way, like, this guy did something awful and, like, is ready to face the music? Well, I think the first thing is that this probably points to Dynamic not paying very well to... They're, I mean, he's driven a van for Dynamic for years now, driving across the country, selling their discs. And to get in this kind of medical debt means he probably doesn't have great insurance, um, which not ideal there. Uh, I guess it's one thing if he's a company and they're paying the money to his company for a tournament versus if he's just using his own personal accounts to, you know, take this money and then used it elsewhere i'm not sure i it's bad yeah i'm not sure exactly how bad and i don't know the legalese to that but i i think it definitely is a major issue that is getting swept under by some people but i think the majority aren't taking it just as a oh he's been a good guy right well, Hunter, let me ask you this, because this is one thing I think that's easy to perceive without knowing all the details is one thing that he said kind of in the post was he had been using t funds from tournaments to fund other things in the disc golf industry before getting to this point where it was personal purchases, uh, essentially. So, number one, do you believe that if he was willing to do it once, do you think he did it more often than not? And number two... Do you think it was valid for him to be doing it kind of as a business format, using it for other disc golf tournaments and just hoping it caught up in the first place? Or was that just a slippery slope he never should have been on? Well, first off, he, he said he'd done it before. He said he did this every year. Right, um, but, not, I don't think he, but not for personal purchases. Personal, I don't know. I don't think that's how, what he claimed. This is how I interpreted yeah. reading it. I don't know Jay Ray personally, Jonathan Ray, whatever he goes by. I know he's associated with Dynamic. I don't know employee status-wise if he's an employee. It seemed from the outside looking in that he almost – owns whatever van thing he drives and that is his business that he vends for dynamic and that is his um so if you look at it from a business owner perspective like i can understand how this happened that doesn't excuse it happening it's still very wrong right because if you look at it you have this tournament that's a guaranteed sellout or guaranteed i mean we're talking twenty six thousand dollars here he has twenty six thousand dollars come into the business bank account right you can uh, i can understand where Typical, typically, you know, he said he used some of that for um, like paying for vendor fees and stuff like that. You know, you can you can understand the cash flow. He has a bunch of money coming in. He's spending some of that here and there. Um, and typically, he said he would earn that money back. If this is his only job, obviously, then he could be pulling some of that money out to be paying for personal stuff and all of that. Um, but at the end of the day, twenty six thousand dollars still owed back to yeah. the, the the players. And that's where you really, I don't know the legal line of until you get caught, because now right. it's illegal. Obviously, right. now this is, I believe, embezzlement or false advertising, or there's a bunch of different things this could go with. I don't know the technical line, but now this is illegal because now you are not able to deliver refunds. You have now stolen $150 from 170 players. Um, now that is illegal. Up to that point, what he was doing historically, I don't know the legal line of that. Right. I just know really bad idea. Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. I think it's easier for people to grasp if you look at it in the scope of a physical product. Yeah. Because this would essentially be like us at Foundation pre-selling a – I see a PA5 in front of me over there, okay? We have 1,000 PA5s that are coming in, okay? We haven't bought them yet, so but we're going to pre-sell them. We sell those 1,000 PA5s for 20 bucks a piece. We have $20,000 come in. Then instead of buying those PA5s to sell to people, we then spend that on other stuff thinking, well, that money will eventually make it back. Like We'll be able to recoup and buy the PA5s later. And then when it comes time to buy the PA5s, we've put all the money on black, lost it all in Vegas, mm. and now I'm like, hey, 
not only can I not send you the PA5, I can't refund you either. Right. Like when it's tangible like that, it feels a lot more black and white, like, oh, not dip, that's wrong and illegal. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Terry Miller's called a lot of flack. And the reason Terry Miller's called a lot of flack is he said something that should have been said in private in public, right? Because I have no problem with what Terry Miller said being a text message. Because if this is me and Trevor, okay, and let's say that Trevor's the one that's going through this, and I'm close with Trevor. I don't know how close Terry and Jonathan Ray are, but I, I, from the reading the post, it seems like they've been through a lot. They've, like, helped grow the sport, yada, yada, yada. I'm not questioning if Jonathan Ray hasn't done a lot for the sport. It doesn't matter what you've done for the sport. You just stole $26,000. But... I can understand if Trevor just went through that and people online are piling on him. I know Trevor's in a bad spot because I know him personally, and then now he's getting piled on. Of course I'm texting him and saying, hey, man, look, don't listen to the people online. Like, let's really, let's, I'm here for you if you need help, if, you, if I can help you however you need to really get yourself out of this. Like, right. I'm here for you as a friend. That's fine because that's not me publicly saying – I support this guy. Don't worry. Trevor's a good guy. I know he stole $150 from you, but he's a good guy. I vouch for him. Well, Terry, do you vouch for the $150 that should be in my pocket? Because if so, write me a check and we can be on the same page. That's the problem there. And that's where Terry, and he's had to backtrack because I think he was just trying to say like, Jonathan, dude, I'm here for you. I'm all about that. Terry Miller, nice guy, right? Being a nice guy. Doing that publicly then puts him in a bad spotlight. Real fire on right now is I think I heard I haven't seen this, but I heard that Rebecca Duffy slash the PDGA basically came out and it seems like, well, we got to do our due diligence right now. The hate he's receiving is punishment enough. No. Whoa. Okay. No, 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 no. The PDGA, this should be in, <laughs> right with this. He, he <laughs> Brody crazy. put this on tour life and it's a pretty good way. If I walk into, uh, if there was a known robbery at yeah. a bank, bb and just got robbed. $26,000 is missing. Maybe he doesn't even exist. And so I, that's crazy. True, yeah, true. It's just not right. <laughs> and I walked into the Lynchburg Police Department and I said, hey, you know that $26,000 that's missing yeah, from the bank? It's me, man. I stole it. Yeah. It was me. Are they going to be like, okay, thanks for the information. Let's investigate. Then we'll arrest you. Yeah. And let me walk out the door? No. They're going to put me in handcuffs and be like, this guy just committed. We have it on record. He just committed to doing this. We're going we're gonna to arrest you and then we'll figure out and figure out what's going on. The PDGA right now, this is their chance to make sure no one else does this right. and say, hey, not not only did he just promise a, a player's pack was going to have three discs and he only delivered two and, you know, where is that gray area? We got to figure out. This is a pro-only tournament. Yeah. The only thing players are getting here is cash. It's and a very saying, straight up transaction. I don't have cash. And he's admitting, I've lost the money. Now, did he fall into hard times and, you know, all that? Sure, it sounds like it. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse the action. Though. Yeah. And as the PDGA... This is a, I mean, freaking Bradley Williams got, or, or like what, a nine month suspension, like a bunch of probation and suspension for shoulder, check. for shoulder checking Matt Dollar. Yeah. This guy just sold $26,000. I'm sorry. I've shoulder checked someone before in my life. I've never sold $26,000. Not now. We're comparing apples to oranges there a little bit, but still, if you're going to suspend someone from their lives earning for that long and then put them on probation, uh, Nico LaCastro similarly just stood up to an official and got like suspended. This tournament director, he should not be running tournaments for the foreseeable future, possibly Forever. ever. Forever, yeah. 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 Uh, or at least a, <laughs> hey, we're going to suspend him until we can look into right. how this happened and make sure yeah. what did you break, how did it, like, what, what happened? So you're suspended until we figure that out. Once we figure that out, you're banned for life. Like, the PDJ needs to be proactive there, because if not, why wouldn't other people do it? Because that's right. the other thing, is this could have been easier to sweep under the rug and no one know had it been an AM tournament. Mm -hmm. Because if this is an AM tournament, you have $26,000 come in of AM registrations. You can kind of cover $26,000 worth of players packs with like ten dollars to $13,000. So now you only have to make up half. And then PDGA-wise, if you gave that direct value back out, you can lose the other $13,000 and and kind of wipe your hands clean and be like, okay, well, we, I gave out 100% value in and out. Play, people might be upset that their players pack, you know, they're not getting payout or whatever, but right. I'm clean by PDGA rules. Right. And you can live that life. Pro tournament, it's just cash in, cash out. And uh, I've heard rumors of people stepping up to cover this. I, don't, I know there's supposed to be some announcement on Smashbox last night. I haven't had a chance to watch that last, yet. So I don't know if someone's going to step up, eat the 26 grand and cover it. If they do, big props to them. Um, but it, it doesn't crime, excuse yeah. what yeah. he did. And I know he probably fell into hard times. I don't want to pile on him. But 
he stole money. Right. You, yeah. At the end of the day, you got to so, be charged yeah. for crime. Yeah, especially yeah. When, when the PDGA kind of lauds itself as, hey, we are the, the runners and organizers of tournaments. That's our thing. We make this happen. And I think there's so many people. This is just on the big stage with a really well-known TD. How many other smaller TDs have done stuff like this? So it calls into question, like, what systems of accountability are they putting in place to make sure this doesn't mm-hmm. happen? Because I know we've all been in this place before. Like, well, I'm not sure what the TD's doing with our money. Yeah. But somehow it's there. Mm-hmm. You know, so what is the PDGA doing? Like, that's the next thing for them is I want to know, you know, yeah, take your time for your investigation. I agree with you, Hunter. Like, let's get this guy out. He's... He, for now, he's suspended from running tournaments. But what is going to be our answer for the future if we're supposedly the organization that runs tournaments? Yeah. How are you going to handle this? You know, what, what systems of accountability you're building? Well, I think one thing, the the PDGA, this should also be a, like a, a gut check moment a little bit too for them because it's too easy to do as well. Because on the yeah. back end, it, as it's someone who's run a bunch of tournaments, the PDGA just believes what I feed them. Mm-hmm. So if I said I'm charging $40 entry fee for this tournament and I tell the PDGA the player's pack was worth $45, but I gave you one disc, you know, like, well, it was a custom stamp, you know, I got, had an right. artist do a limited edition custom stamp. Yeah. So you could flip it for 45 That's its market value, but it's one singular disc. Right. Well, no, but the PDGA, it's just going to be a green check mark because I type in whatever I want to type in. Mm-hmm. Um, similar thing for cash payout. They aren't following that I ever sent that PayPal mm-hmm. to a pro mm-hmm. player. You know, if a pro player cashed three hundred dollars, I send them two fifty. They come after me of like, what? Hey, where's my extra fifty bucks? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Now it's a he said, she said, and it's over fifty dollars. Mm-hmm. And the PDG has no way. To, I don't know what they should put in place to run that, but like. To me, there should be some type of a valid check. Maybe you have to provide PayPal receipts or something where there's at least a paper trail that the PDGA, if it gets brought to them, yeah. they can now have a way to go look at this tournament. Oh, here's the full financials with documents for this tournament, not just, well, well you filled out an Excel spreadsheet right. and it all looks good to with us. The, with the t- amount of tournaments being run, especially during the COVID boom, like if there was some serious brass and like a really big department for, to investigate accounting and fraud and things like that, who knows how much money was skimmed. Like everybody's been in tournaments that have suspiciously low payouts or players packs. It's oh, just, yeah. that's just a fact uh, of disc golf, but this is certainly one that's right in their face. So hopefully they set some precedent that at least will uh, strike some fear into some people. But um, yeah, moving on from that on to kind of a lighter note, that's definitely gonna be interesting to watch it develop because you know, it, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, regardless of if people pick it up or whatever happens, it was a, you know, serious amount of theft. A lot of people were affected by that. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about disc golf season now as we kind of get closer to the end. We are about to head into the playoffs. Actually, they will be starting uh, tomorrow as this releases. Ooh. So here's the thing. We talked a lot about playoffs and, you know, on Grip Lock last or on Monday, we got kind of fired up about it because, Talking about how it, you know, they don't really seem to be enforcing them well enough to give them any amount of meaning they that they would have. So what I really want to know at this point is, do we feel like the playoffs uh, mechanism is worthwhile? Um, even if it were enforced, would it actually be worthwhile? I guess is the question. Or w- is it really not that important? And did the pro tour maybe just jump into that too soon? Like, what are, what are your thoughts on even? making the attempt to do it and, and especially the fact that they're not enforcing it um josh what do you think about that i think you, when you just said too soon i think that because what they started last year they started calling things playoffs maybe, maybe, two, maybe, two, maybe years, two years maybe two, two years, years. Yeah. Yeah. Three. two years ago two years. way too early i think this year seems to be one of the first minus the couple people that are outside of the the numbers that are signed up but this year seems like one of the first ones where there's actually people being left off that I I think the cut is close and maybe they should have gone a little lower to start and then maybe it's 72 let's say for the first one and as you get more notable people you can increase the cut that's not that tough but it's definitely going to be tougher for them to cut it down more until you know maybe there's more money coming into this and and people are a little more uh driven towards success and people making a career out of this versus people who are doing it for the love of the game they want to travel around keep traveling around with their buddies and make enough to to go by so it's becoming more competitive this is a competitive 
thing that's getting at it. I think it's a good thing. There should be a cut at the end of the season. Just what level should it be? I think they were a little early or a little, a little loose with it when it is playoffs and every other sport that we see has a larger cut than like 50% of the field is getting cut. Right. I don't think that there's 216 players that you can comfortably say are touring professionals. Yeah. 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 I, I think it is uh, certainly a weird line. Um, Hunter, how do you, how do you see things? I know you're frustrated with the playoffs and how it's been enforced, but do you think they should bother with it at all? Yeah, well, it's funny to me is uh, Brody on Tour Life revealed that he got an email saying, congratulations, you've qualified for GMC. He didn't read it. That is But he, he, got, he didn't notice until he, he's already here. And I think he, they said, uh, Silas might be able to fact check me. What place was Brody in? 140-something? 149th. 149th. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So 49 spots outside of the cut line got an email saying, congratulations, you qualified. So Lovely. for me, if we're running the playoffs that way, they're a joke. There's no point to have them. Mm -hmm. Because now you have a player like Brody who read top 100, I'm not in the top 100. I didn't even think, oh, they're going to let other people in. Now, was Brody going to go up to GMC and play? Probably not. Yeah. But was there a player who was in 147th that got that email sitting in California or Arizona and it's like, do I book a flight to Vermont right now? Right. Like, I just got home for the offseason. I thought, maybe. Like, if we're going to – I'm comfortable with the idea of playoffs. I think it adds a good element, okay? But what other sport says – X amount of teams make the playoffs. Eh, you know, if one team's not feeling it, we'll throw another one in, though. Like, what other... Like, if you're doing playoffs, great, fine. It's a good storyline. It's a good drama. But it's not if, like, Justin Rozak, he texted me because um, he thought we didn't talk about him. I did bring him up. Love the guy. Awesome dude. Whatever, okay? That's beside the point. He's in 154th in the Pro Tour stand, and he's playing this weekend. Oh, he did end up in? Yeah, yeah. like, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> What's really going to be an interesting predicament is you have a guy like Tristan Tanner who's had an off year. I think Connor O'Reilly was also on the bubble. I don't remember if he was in or out. But Tristan Tanner shouldn't be playing this weekend, is playing this weekend. What if a guy like him pops off and wins this yeah. weekend? Now he has earned a spot to the Tour Championship <laughs> yeah. with that win yeah. in a tournament that he shouldn't be playing. That's a big mm -hmm. one. So what That's happens there? One. Is it going to happen this year? Probably not. It could, Outside though. the top 100, probably not going to happen. Think about could a guy like it? Drew Gibson. Absolutely. What if, like, Drew, if he's Drew won, won MVP, <laughs> he's in 94th, I think, yeah. Pro Tour standing. If he wins MVP, mm -hmm. same scenario. He now has to get to the Tour Championship in a tournament he shouldn't be playing. That's in. crazy. So yeah. if we're making a that. playoff cut, I'm fine with that idea. Um, I think the reason they want a full field is because they want the purse to be bigger. Yes. Screw the purse. All, only, mm -hmm. The only thing we as fans care about is what is first place taken home. Yeah. And the bottom part of the field makes the purse bigger, but it statistically typically doesn't affect the first place payout. Every person you trim is just making one more person you have to pay, which basically washes it out. So just keep trimming the field. Let's maybe we go 70 person for the first round, 50 for the second thing of playoff, and then 32. And it will increase the drama, increase the product at home, keep the payouts for the top high, and then gives us a reason to care. If we're running the playoffs this way, though, forget the playoffs. Just have a tour championship. These playoffs yeah. are, are pointless. Just make them both plus events, which also mean nothing to me. Make them both <laughs> plus events, and then just run the playoff. Run the run the tour championship. A lot of additives. Yeah. The the thing is, is that what makes a great playoff situation. I mean, look, look at a sport that's done it super well. Look at like the NFL. Um, they create an exclusivity factor when it comes to playoffs. When they get close to it, they will change games on the schedule so that you get to watch the games that really matter. So one of the things I'd love to see is that as we get closer to playoffs, number one, exactly like you said, Hunter, cut the line of the number of people who are going to get in down because it just this should be something players should aspire to be a part of, not just I didn't do very well this season and maybe I had one event that was great, but I can still play at GMC. That's just ridiculous to me. But give us the storylines. You know, the last couple of events tell us, hey, here are the people who are on the bubble. They're not in the top 75 right now, and they're not going to get an invite to uh, the playoffs, which is make, – make it a bigger deal. Right now it feels like the importance of whether you make it in the playoffs or not is just as important as their, um, you know, showing us the Q series. Yeah. 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 That right. also would give you more content because they can – that first round, they can stack a card of those players, send a camera out. Now when there's a downtime, instead of sending the drone into the sky to take a picture of a fairway – you can roll footage of that card of the people that maybe they whole seven they had some crazy happen. 
there's a camera there. Yeah. You're not a, you're not a fan of the drone B-roll shots, Josh? Um, <laughs> they look good. We yeah. ought to, we ought to make a, a grippy for B-roll shot of the year. Cause like my, my favorite still of all time is the golf ball cleaners. That's a good one. That Ooh. to me, I really liked the bleachers at worlds. That, yeah, that was also bleacher. really good. Mm-hmm. Empty bleachers. Yeah. yeah that, that is was a very fun good. One. There might um, be some good B-roll in the, in the videos oh we gosh, shot, you know, so this time. That's but true. You gotta, you gotta watch those to find out. Yeah. Uh, so, so speaking of the playoffs and you know they are happening and then we do have the tour championship and one guy right now is running away and that is Gannon Burr. Uh, he even is taking it out on the field when it's not on tour. Uh, went to a Q series one by 12 recently. So here's the question. We obviously have a new format this year. We're going to be playing four rounds with a stroke head start that isn't going to reset. So my question is how close does somebody have to get to Gannon to win? Because this is a guy that you give him leads, you let him get in control of tournaments, you give him high levels of focus early on. He's been very hard, nearly impossible to beat. So I'll remind you, first place is going to start at 10 under. That would be him. Uh, second place at 9, third at 8, fourth at 7th, fifth through 8th at 6 under, ninth through 12th at 5 under, 13th through 16th at 4 under, and then it kind of keeps going down every three spots until finally even par for 29th uh, through 32nd. So obviously a four-round tournament. That has kind of been one of his strengths. Hunter, how close does somebody have to get to him? And, and maybe do you even have a player that might be fitting in that slot? Well, I actually, I thought he was going to have a two-stroke head start. One stroke is kind of interesting. You know, we, we actually saw this in golf. They have a very similar FedEx Cup, um, yeah. the very similar format. And we saw Scotty Scheffler, very similar to what Gannon Burr is doing this year, kind of be like, I don't understand why the winner of this one event is the tour champion. Basically being like, I just put in a body of work that no one's seen other than Tiger Woods, and now I have to win one more event with a little bit of a stroke head start to actually be called the tour champion. It is tough. Um, I've been an advocate for this format because I think it makes this weekend more exciting. Oh, yeah. This is where we're going into now the tour championship. It's, it gives the favor to Gannon Burr having a stroke head start over, no offense to Nathan Queen, but the year Nathan Queen just got hot in the bracket play and won. Yeah. Um, I don't like that because that year Nathan Queen was the tour champion right. uh, and was probably one of the, I think he was in like 26 going into the, or something like that. No, he was, he was, he was like a lot. I think he was one of the last spots. So yeah. 31st. There you go. And he won the tour. Like, I didn't like that format. This format does favor the top. Um, but across a four-round event, I mean, it's basically like this is a five-round event. Is mm-hmm. what you have to think of. Yeah. And it's like yeah. Gannon Burr has a one-stroke lead. Right. The only five-round event this year, Gannon Burr lost. It's true. So statistics point to him for four. Do not point to him for five. You Didn't have one-stroke that, lead, though. Think of it there. <laughs> uh, but, no, realistically, anyone that's within three or four, I think, has a really solid shot. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we're going back to Nevin unless they've announced a change. Yeah, I think it's it still Nevin. Nevin. Check, yeah. um, so, honestly, uh, Isaac Robinson is creeping up towards that top top few spots. If he's not already there, you got to like him. you got to like Ricky Wysocki, who's going to be up there. I think both of those guys, if they're within four shots, they're, they're right in it um, attacking Gannon. But for the continuity of the season, I want to see the best player win. I want to see Gannon Burke go out there and win this thing so that we have a tour points champion and the tour champion matchup um because gannon burr has played a phenomenal season and he deserves to that title yeah it's a satisfying explanation point for sure yeah i think that um y- y- the point you put out there nevin is a, is a difficult enough course that i think there are players who can definitely get into it and isaac is probably the only person who i'd say i would feel good about winning other than Gannon just because of the play he's been putting up recently his the play he had at Worlds I think it's going to take whoever it is it's going to take the best round or the best tournament of the year to beat Gannon uh, and I think that's why Gannon's going out and slapping people around on these other weekends because he just wants to keep hot he wants to keep riding that train of I'm on top I'm playing well because taking those weeks off I think just kind of makes him feel a little cold so I don't know that there's anyone who's going to be able to keep up with Gannon in a four-round event, but you know, a five-round event if you count the, the scores coming in. But I think the only person right now that I have on my radar, other than an outside look at, uh, one would say a dark horse look, at Ricky, it'd probably be Isaac. Yeah. Yeah, Josh, what do you think? I think that the, the season Gannon's put up, he definitely should take it. And I think having a one-stroke lead might not quite be enough. I almost think that it should be a little less less tiers of leads, but a little more like first place has a, two strokes on second through eighth, and then eighth through sixteen is another two strokes. It's like bigger um, tiers, bigger yeah. bigger tiers, 
it still gives people because the person in 32nd at this has zero chance realistic unless they turn into the best disc golfer on the planet yeah. immediately well which i don't know where paul's sitting depends if like a, it depends if like an eagle mcmahon yeah. would fall yeah. into that if 30 second does. spot yeah what was the head start because isaac robinson currently sitting in fifth what is that head start from fifth up? four shots four shots because this is where the playoffs are really interesting to me is these next two events, the the top half of the field are jockeying for their stroke head start position. Yeah, big difference. Because Isaac being five shots back or four shots back, probably not happening. Yeah. Very possible, but probably not. Isaac getting to two shots, I really like him there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the separation of about 100 points. Or, yeah, about 100 between Isaac and Calvin from yeah. fifth to third. Well, and so these next two tournaments, where I really like Isaac at both of them, mm -hmm. at GMC and at MVP could really move himself up, gain those two strokes. And what is great about the Tour Championship is that's not only two strokes. We're talking about big money differences Oh yeah. when we go to Tour Championship. That's one thing I also love about it is the difference between first and tenth. Like, everyone gets paid. That's what everyone loves about that. Everyone gets paid. But you could be talking about 20 grand is the yeah. difference. And yeah. that can all be settled a lot of times from these playoffs. And it's like, if I would have just had three more strokes, I'd be going home with $15,000 instead of walking home with five. Yeah. Yeah, because there's there's only there's less than I think a hundred points difference between Isaac and the next two spots above him. So good performances at both places could give him. Yeah, and and you have to remember too, you know, Isaac even being a few strokes back. I think New London round one of Worlds. I think he beat Gannon by like seven. Yeah, like he he did beat him by a pretty good margin. So they, it'll be interesting to see just because you do have the wooded course element. I know they've set out ne they've set up Nevin really hard in the past mm -hmm. and four straight rounds there. It'll be it's always mm -hmm. interesting to see. Um, so one final thing we want to get to here is we have only two events left at this point, um, uh, w w not including the Tour Championship. Obviously, we have these two playoff events, and there are still quite a few players out there that are. Um, winless on the season right now. Like, that's just where we're getting at to right now. Feel free to look at a list if you need to rejog re your memory. But I want to know if there's any that players that come to mind, MPO or FPO, winless players this season that have a really good shot in your mind of grabbing one and really changing, flipping their season around, getting that, that you know, just last surge and grabbing a win in Vermont or Massachusetts. Um, Gary, do, you, do any come to mind for you? I think there are two players on the top of a lot of people's minds, and uh, we can't say have this conversation without talking about Paul Macbeth. Yeah. Because for sure. I think this is we this would be the first year in what nine years that he hasn't had an A tier or greater win in a season. Yeah, something like something that. Something like that. So that's a that's a big deal, I think, for a lot of people, especially like the Paul legacy people. So it, it might win, be more than that, it, honestly, Gary, because I mean, he won his first world title in twenty twelve. Then, then you know what? I think it might be like 2011. It might be a long time. Yeah. It could, it could be like yeah. 13, I think you won an NC in yeah. 2011. You're right. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a long time, so, <laughs> regardless. Even, even, even bigger. So, yeah. Paul, I mean, the need for Paul to get a win here is, I think, really big on him from like a legacy perspective. But the other person who sticks out to me is like an Ezra Robinson. Yeah. Who has put himself oh, yeah. consistently there, but just can't get over the hump. And he's showing us that he can play well in the woods and play well in the open for the most part. And I think that these courses present a good opportunity for him to be successful. It's just can he get that that monkey off his back of finishing the final round? Yeah. Or um, in some cases, like Idlewild, he has a great final round, but he kind of buries himself early. I feel like we haven't seen a consistent in, in any event all the rounds of the event Ezra showing us his true potential. So yeah. I've got my eye on him. Uh, for the next few events, I'd love to see him get a win. That'd be huge for him. Um, but we'll see. But those are the two that are on top of my mind. Okay. Josh, how about you? I think my pick has to be Eagle. I yeah. Think Great pick. Third at Worlds, eighth at Deeglo. Um, I think that he's fully back from injury and at least doesn't look like he's throwing any short or anything. His forehand still, even though he's throwing at 50%, is going 450 feet. So, oh, yeah. You know, he's he, he's – also got a slower tempo game some players can't slow their arm down so mm -hmm. when he goes into the woods at uh, Brewster that shouldn't be too bad I think it's going to come down to especially like does he still have does he know his discs enough at this point like I think that's one of the things holding him back is he's still I mean a year later with very different discs he's been with one company with a limited mold selection to his bag yeah. with Dismania. So now that he has literally a hundred options of discs right. to throw, right. he had to narrow them down for so much. And I mean, MVP discs in general do wear down very slowly, but they hit a point, especially if you 
when you're you know throwing them for a while those softer rims might get a chunk out of it and now it flies completely different and now you have to redo that from the start which could take you an extra three months to get one back to that slot um, and I think he's also slightly on a pitch count when it comes to you yeah. know he just wants to be safe so he's not throwing that disc in the field every day of the week just getting to learn it he's probably doing one or two rounds with his discs in his bag and then going to the tournament so. right I, I do think as far as eagle like and the players that like obviously Paul too would be a pretty dramatic turnaround for his season but I think Eagle because he carried the excuses of the which valid to, to some extent the injury and switching manufacturers I think a lot of people have kind of cooled off on those by this point and are just kind of seeing him for what he's at right now um, but I think if you were able to win very quickly maybe even myself included kind of this the narrative this season becomes less of okay what's the eagle we have now and it becomes more of a okay it took him a while but he's got it back and expectations going into next season look a little bit different or a lot different i should say um hunter what do you think eagle is definitely the first one that came to my mind um and obviously paul for for great reasons paul actually surprised me he's in eighth place in the tour standings right he's, now he's still stayed um, up there yeah so yeah a win could really be drastic for him but the two people i'm gonna go with are actually the people right behind him which are Kyle Klein and Chris Dickerson. Yeah. I think both of them have had really solid seasons. Chris Dickerson a little bit more than Kyle Klein, in my opinion, in the scheme of what they're capable of. But for Kyle, I think why it's important is you have Gannon Burr and um, Nicholas Antela are on the team with him. They're the three, like, Sky Team or whatever at Discmania. But they're kind of seen as these are our faces. This is who we're riding with. Both have wins this year. Gannon having an hist a historic season. Nicholas having a very solid season. Both with wins. <laughs> I think for Kyle to kind of keep his name in the hat of like, hey, you know, he is Mr. Forgettable a lot of times, but yeah. hey, Discmania, I'm still here too, former major champion, don't forget about me. Yeah. A win could be big, yes, season-wise, but also career-wise as, you know, we just saw House of Discs restructure somewhat. Money's not the same as it was when a lot of players were signing contracts. Performance is going to really matter for these top guys if you want to be able to kind of bully your way into a, a contract that is even comparable to what people were signing in 2021. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is a contract year for Kyle Klein, but it could be important just keeping his name in the same hat of like Discmania's crop of talent and not getting left behind by Nick Lawson Gannon. And then Chris Dickerson, just legacy-wise, he doesn't play when we go to the West Coast. Um, I think he finally traveled to Europe this year, but like a lot of times that's not happening either. He doesn't so when he is present, he has to make his presence known. And right now, a lot of people don't realize how good of a season he's been having. Oh, yeah. So if he were able to win at GMC, which he's done before, if he were able to win it, or was he the one that choked it away? I don't remember. Uh, um, he may have choked that one away. I think yeah. it was the choke that I called a choke that Brody came after me saying, not a choke, whatever. Yeah, Anyways, he's performed very well at GMC regardless before. So Chris Dickerson, GMC, really like him there, really like him at Maple Hill. He's won USDGC before. Um, and honestly, the Tour Championship, he's in an okay spot too. So yeah. I think Chris Dickerson's another one that a win could really shape how people perceive what is a very solid year for him that's going to get forgotten if he doesn't win. The table is set for him, yeah. for sure. And I don't want to miss, and everyone out there knows, I'm a big advocate for for the FPO and the European players, but I don't want to miss an opportunity also to look at the FPO side where you've got someone like Kat Merch who's been really, really competitive recently, and I feel like she's on the cusp of a win but can't seem to get it over the line. Yeah. But I look down the board a little bit, and there are two two names that I feel like we used to talk about so much more, and that you've got Henna, yep. who yeah. it used to be like – you know, Kristen, Henna, Evelina, and it doesn't mm -hmm. really feel like Henna's in that conversation anymore. No. And then you've got Haley King. Yep. They're like, where has she been this season? Yep. So uh, I think there are some some definite some FBO players that I'm shocked don't have a win this year. Um, and maybe this is a good time for them, and, and maybe they can get off the, the struggle bus. But I feel like Kat is the closest of the three of them yeah. in terms of getting a win. But once again, same kind of conversation as Ezra. It's like, can she play every round to her level, or does she kind of let one get off the rails a little bit? But yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think, yeah, if nothing changes, to look back and think, if I had told you at the beginning of the season that going winless this year will be Paul, Eagle, Kyle Klein, Chris Dickerson, like these names that we're naming, it's like it's definitely pretty insane. I would and say almost Isaac Robinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like it, it's it's mm -hmm. been that tough to win, um, and when you've got no. On the flip side, it hasn't been that tough to win if your name is say, Gannon. If you, well, I would say if you're AB Gannon, you know you're chewing up all the wins. It it definitely becomes a different ball game. But um, and Chris did win in 2021. 
I looked that up for yes, GMC. GMC. Okay. Oh, he did. There you go. Okay, so, okay, there you I think go. It was twenty twenty two. He yeah. was definitely the guy that laid up a putt. There was a putt layup situation yeah, at some point that I called him out for, and Brody was like, "No, it was a genius. He should have done it." And I was like, "Well, lost then the he changed his mind. Remember." Because he went to when yeah. he went to GMC, he like took a picture of it. He's like, yeah, guys, I changed right. my mind. So that must have been like 2022 or something. It was a big, mm-hmm. it was a big deal around here. But uh, yeah, that's all we have for this uh, this episode, Hunter. I'll let you get Salas's attention if you want uh, while I'm <laughs> exiting the show, so he can stop it. Yep, I will try. Um, but if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a like, and also you can click the link in the description to submit topics. We only, we literally now at this point have a show after GMC, a show after Maple Hill. And then what do we have? Is there a week off before USDGC? I think I think there is. So we might have like four shows left at this point, um, but it's definitely getting towards the end. So if you want to have a topic discussed, if you've been holding on to it, now is the time to do so. Um, throw that in there. But thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed this different episode of Debate Night, but we'll be back next week with our normal format. See you then.